Go. Oh, hopefully it's streaming clear. I think I might have got some crap in my screen there. You guys see me? Um, one thing I want to talk about today, beyond the live Q&A that we do every single week, and you know, bring your questions. If you have any, you know, if you're watching the replay right now, put them in the comments, I'm happy to answer them. If you're watching live with me, then uh, shoot them in the comments and happy to answer them. Today, I was thinking, and actually last night, I was just scrolling through some, where did this idea come from? So I was scrolling through my Instagram feed, my Facebook feed, and there's like four people that I follow that are in either Costa Rica, actually like seven people that I follow that are in Florida, Costa Rica, or Puerto Rico. And I'm looking and you know, people in Florida are talking about like the no income tax. And then there's people in Costa Rica talking about how any investment income is completely tax free. And then in Puerto Rico, it's like, hey, there's no capital gains tax. There's like a 4% uh, tax on, on everything you earn. And I'm sitting there doing some numbers and I'm like, geez, I'm on a fat fire or lux fire level where moving to one of those locations would literally put six figures net in my pocket after accounting for my entire living expenses being paid for. And I thought about that and I said it to myself again, I was like, the amount of tax I would save moving to one of those locations would, we're talking well in the six figures in tax savings. That's potentially a lot of money. And I'm moving that over and I'm like, that would pay for a mansion in say Costa Rica or you know Puerto Rico or something. Um, so I don't know, I, I wanna explore this further. People are from, from Puerto Rico, people are following this from Costa Rica who have done the expat thing. I'm a Canadian, so it's a little bit different, but my understanding is if I renounced my Canadian, I wouldn't have to renounce my Canadian citizenship, I could stay Canadian, but just my Canadian health benefits and filed an exit return for Canada. I could come back and file a return in Canada again anytime, move back to Canada whenever I want, wouldn't lose my citizenship, but then if I moved to like Costa Rica, as an example, would pay no tax on any investment um, income. So any options trading, any dividend stuff. And I have a huge portfolio. I'm like, I could, in theory, this is this was an idea, and I probably don't think I would do this. I'd probably set up some sort of trust or company that would um, not be primarily me running it. Someone else would, would be running it. They would continue to run the real estate piece and then personally file no, not need to file any returns because I wouldn't be drawing anything from a Canadian source, but I don't know, I'm just noodling on it. Maybe it's silly and maybe it's because it's so darn cold here right now. Like literally it's negative 18 degrees Celsius outside. Um, it's so cold outside, just doesn't make sense. This week we got a cold spell. This Sunday is supposed to be, they were saying up to negative 20 and even colder with wind chill. And I'm like, I could, I could really go for some warm sandy beaches right now. Um, not only that, there's been some other things that have sort of been on my mind about where the Canadian government has been going with some of the lockdown rules and some of the things they've been pushing out under the guise of COVID, taking away a lot of our, our rights and freedoms. Uh, as an example, you know, neighbors are calling on each other. If you have a friend come over to visit, they're calling the police and being like, hey, these people are meeting up and they're talking in person. Like they're literally throwing people in jail and finding people. And as an example, when you come back from a trip in Canada, uh, Trudeau put in some new measures that uh, he was detaining people at the border um, as they land their flights to take them to an undisclosed location for two weeks, a government location, and not tell their family. How is that legal? I mean, it isn't legal, but this kind of stuff is happening and it's, it's scary um, how socialist and how complacent we are here in Canada. Like, I, I honestly think that my neighbors would, if police came and ripped me out of my house and threw me in an undisclosed location, my neighbors would probably just watch and do nothing. Like the Canadian approach of like, oh, it's fine. Government would never screw us. Anyway, so forget the tax piece. Just this country is, I drive in some of the rougher areas of town and I, I see it. I see people suffering. There's a lot of suffering and a lot of it's self-inflicted. Unfortunately, a lot of people are, are not trying to elevate themselves out of the situation. They're just... I don't know. It's sad. I think UBI is a good solution, but, uh, oh, it's, yeah, someone just commented, hit negative 40 here this week. Yeah, really, 40 degrees, negative 40 Celsius, by the way, guys. Like, your nose drips, freeze instantly. Your eyes can literally freeze open. That's how cold it is. Um, <laughs> you pay extra tax to be in those three places. I feel the same way. Like if I can be down in, in Costa Rica right now with a compound that's paid for completely by my tax savings. Like I have a mansion down there with two nannies, 
cleaning, cooking, taking care of me and my family, and a private tutor teaching us to we're fluent in Spanish. My kids can grow up you know, in private school. And it's still going to cost me less than spending zero in Canada and paying tax. And so that's, that's wild when I think about that. And it was on my bucket list, you know, back in, uh, I did a financial analysis on myself and did a sort of a projection plan. I did a financial planning course in 2013 and I built myself like a really cool financial plan. It's like 40 pages. And within that, I've, I've blown away all the, the targets that I thought I would hit. But one of them was actually to retire to Costa Rica. And I did a little project on that in 2013. And I was revisiting that the other night thinking, hmm, that's cool. That's cool that I, I lost track of that goal. But for now, maybe I'll spend a few months a year somewhere warm. I think that uh, for me, I like, I like the healthcare, the, I like the, uh, the safety. There's just a lot of great things going on in Costa Rica. Um, Puerto Rico's got some nice things too, because it is um, you know, United States. So there's some advantages there. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, those are the two that I really like. I like the safety. I like being able to walk the streets and feel, you know, like I'm not gonna get stabbed or something. Uh, so that's, I mean, and to be honest, there are areas now here in Canada where in the rough area of town, you walk the street and you might, you likely will get stabbed. So, I mean, no matter where you live, you're taking a risk, especially as the divide between the ultra rich and the poor gets larger. Well, I had my brother over on the weekend. We were talking, he's a socialist. So we were talking, he's almost like a communist. We were talking, and by the way, I'm not entirely a free market you know, capitalist, but I do believe that you should be rewarded for what you, like my basic ethos or like understand, like my basic philosophy is that you should, the harder you work, the better you, uh, the better you should be treated, the, better, the more luxuries you should have, the better life you should have. It should be proportional to the amount of work you're putting in. And I think that uh, a lot of, I want to say, I want to say that, the, I want to say the bottom half, but that's, that's the wrong word to use. There are folks on a bell curve who are in the bottom half, I guess. I don't know what to call them, but people who are struggling right now, who are, they make less than the median. So they're lower than the median income, lower than the median net worth, lower than the, the average. They're in the bottom half. And by definition, there's a bell curve, right? And half people are below, half people are above. And the problem is the distribution between the top quartile and the bottom quartile is getting larger. The rich are richer than they've ever been. Like we have, we have billionaires that have more wealth than some nations. Like if you put Jeff Bezos, um, you know, Bill Gates and Elon Musk in a room, a few other billionaires, they have more economic power and influence and et cetera and so forth than many countries have, right? So it's just, it's a point where there's just so much at the top and so little at the bottom, so much disparity, right? That what you need to win an election is about 50%, right? And so if you can just control and say, hey, to the bottom half who are struggling, we'll take some from the rich and give it to the poor. You don't have to work, here's free money. Guess what, you win the election. There's, there's democracy. Um, tyranny of the majority, I like to call it. It's not a real term, it's never talked about in my political science classes, but tyranny of the majority is the idea that a majority or 51% of people agree on something. And it could be like, let's kill all these people who are rich. And they could just agree on that. And if they all agree and they get the votes, democracy, they get it. Um, but I, I do believe honestly that there should be incentive to do things. If you don't incentivize humans, we don't, I guess the underlying fundamental assumption to me is that humans are lazy and we look for the, we're like water. We look for the easiest path. That's just, there are exceptions to that rule, but most people look for the easiest path. And then on top of that, humans are also selfishly motivated. People in our inner circles mean more to us than people in the outer circles. That's just a fact. And so we care for people in our inner circles more, which means we have bias, which means we have favoritism, which means we're not all equal. It just, I don't know. So that's why communism doesn't really work. But anyway, I don't wanna get into philosophy tonight. I don't know why I brought that up, but I was digging into, into thinking how things are gonna play out in the next 20 years. And I was looking at like the economics of, of Canada. And I see us drifting more and more socialist and more and more like, I think universal basic income is gonna come. They've already pilot tested it. And they're talking about forgiving anyone who applied for, for the free serve money, the Canadian economic relief benefit because of COVID. Um, if they applied for it and they were still working, they're talking about, hey, if you're self-employed, it's okay, you can keep the money. Like don't even pay it back. If you applied for it, you didn't deserve it, that's fine, keep the money. And they're giving away $2,000 a month to everyone. And I think they're beta testing universal basic income. I don't know who's gonna pay for it. I don't know how it's gonna get paid for it. 
I mean, I have an idea. I think they're going to take from those who work, you know, 60 or 70 percent of what they're earning and give it to those who aren't working um, or are working jobs that don't pay very well. But I don't know. It's going to be a scary place to be for someone like. I guess me and my brother had different philosophies and I have friends like this, too. I, I grew up poor and so I, I can really understand what it's like to come from nothing and to be struggling to make ends meet. Like my mom went to the food, we used to go to the food bank to get food, right? And that was a huge so safety net for us. And so it's hard. Like my friends who were rich were go do going to like violin lessons and piano lessons and private tutors. And I was struggling just to get my freaking homework done. I come to school without it done. The teacher would scold me and then I'd do worse. And it was, an, it was a self-defeating cycle. And I get that, that growing up in poverty, it's hard. There needs to be ladders, like clear ladders and ropes that you can grab onto to elevate class if you want. The cycle is hard. And so trying to make things fair, I'm all in support of. I would happily pay some tax to ensure that there are good schools, um, basic free healthcare. As an example, I almost died. Like, if there wasn't free healthcare, I'd have been dead. 50 night of several grand mal seizures, ended up hospitalized, almost died. They like spinal tapped me. I don't talk about this a lot, but like I, I had health issues. I'd be dead today if we were in like, the prehistoric days, right? If there wasn't um, free healthcare, probably. So it's just, you know, there, there is some benefit to social nets and to safety systems. And I think that being someone now that's in the, in the 1%, you know, who was elevated out of, you know, I was in the bottom 10, 20% probably growing up and having escaped that, that class, I can say that I did it through sheer hard work. Right. And some people would say, well, Mike, you know, you had good genetics. My brother hasn't, you know, really been able to escape that as an example. And I mean, similar genetics. So maybe it isn't just genetics. It could be something more. I think, you know, some people would argue, Hey, you're born with good genetics or you're born into good circumstance. And I think it's a combination of the two, but I think it's not fair to blame the system or to blame bad genetics or to blame your circumstance. Why not, you know, why not sit down and say, Hey, let's take some accountability. What can I do today to change my circumstance tomorrow? That's, that's what I did at 15, 16. And that's how I ended up where I am today, right? Is, is making those cognizant changes to my mindset and to say, you know, when I'm, when I thought I was tapped out for the day to push myself an extra hour, same like in, in weight training or whatever you're trying to do, you got to push a little more and those little pushes that you're doing that no one else is doing will allow you to elevate so fast. Um, Link the hero, Costa Rica is paradise on earth in my opinion. This is awesome. I want to get a thread going on, by the way, if you're following this stream right now and you're from Costa Rica or you're from Puerto Rico, uh, please send me a DM on, on Instagram at Mike Rosart. I'd love to connect. I'd love just to hear your opinion. If you've moved from Canada or the U.S. to Costa Rica, what's been the what's been what's have you had a family do it? Like what what, do you, what has your experience been like? I want to learn. Uh, I'm going to go there and just try it out. So I've already committed that regardless of what happens with this COVID crap, this fall I'm either going to Puerto Rico or Costa Rica to uh, <laughs> Peter Schiff. I will. I'll have to link up with him. Um, yeah, I'm going to go check one of those places out or both of those places out and stay for a few months and see what it's really like. And you know that I don't do anything without thinking it through fully. So there'll be a lot of deliberate thought going into this. And I don't know if right away I would ever relinquish, you know, being in Canada at least six months a year or more to keep my health benefits, et cetera, so forth. It'd be a big move to move from Canada to there. And I'd have to be sure that I could do something that keep me busy there. So I'd have to develop some sort of business or something. At least I can just options trade there right on the beach. So that's, that's something I can do to keep busy. But uh, yeah, it's just thinking about these things. It's kind of fun. It's like, hey, I got to go down there and, and check it out first and see what's, see what's good. Try some different towns out, some different places. And you know, having like three kids and re relocating like that, like, what, does that what does that look like? I mean, with COVID, who knows if the schools are even going to be open anyway. I mean, everyone's schooling from home anyway. And these lockdowns, I mean, I'd rather be locked down in paradise, to be honest locked down here in the in the tundra of Canada. Okay, I'm gonna go to the questions for a sec and then we'll go back to whatever I was talking about, philosophy or something. Hey, how you doing, Stubot? Inside uh, view photography, how you doing? Alice says, do you ever foresee Saskatchewan real estate ever going back up again? To be honest, I don't follow Saskatchewan real estate, so I can't really comment. I've been to Saskatchewan once. We stayed for a few days on my way through the mountains and then eventually into to uh, BC and then we flew actually to the Yukon and uh, I checked out some farmland there and stuff so 
I mean, I know nothing about the market there. My understanding is that in pockets of out east and out west, like you're talking about, um, there's been some areas heavily hit and there wasn't a whole lot of appreciation. There are areas like that in Canada that have had no appreciation. And yet here in Southwestern Ontario, a house is worth almost double four years later. Like every house, every condo, everything's doubled in like four years. So I'm blessed that here we have this crazy appreciation and there's, it's just not the same there. So I, I would say if you're investing in that market, um, focus on cash flow, right? They can't take cash flow away from you. So that's a big thing. Hey, there's a super chat. Jamal says, discuss your first five mortgages. And by the way, everyone knows who's watching. If you've watched my show and you've watched other what, almost 150 episodes of this live stream podcast, my gross art show that I do for the last three years, coming up on three years this March. One of my, my first ever episode had Graham Stephan. He came to my house and we were hanging out and this is before he had popped off. He was still doing really well, but um, he was actually on my first ever Wise Wealth show or uh, my gross art show. Three years, pretty crazy. Uh, so the, the, if you super chat, by the way, you always get your question prioritized. So prioritized question. So discuss your first five mortgages, down payments, JVs, which banks did you use? I have two properties that I'm looking to expand. I'd love to hear your story with the banks, the mortgages and down payments and sources. So I'll get lots of stories. I've told them probably before, but I don't know if I've ever talked about my first five mortgages. My first 10 mortgages were all myself. So I didn't JV partner until I got to like property 15. I was a lone wolf sole investor. I was focused entirely on growing it all by myself, lone wolf. I'm not saying that was the right thing to do. Um, my net worth grew a lot more when I stopped doing the sole investing strategy. Uh, I was afraid to take on borrowed capital, so I figured joint venture partnering was smarter. That's why I did the joint venture partnering. But rewind it back to what I did in my first five deals. My first ever deal, I was 19. So I had a hard time getting a mortgage because I worked 30 hours a week while going to school full time. I was on a scholarship and I, I was working as a teller actually. And my own employer was a local credit union. They said no to giving me a mortgage. They're like, we get that you know, at the time my girlfriend, um, now my wife, Elise, she was working. She's making, she's like a resident advisor. She's making like 15K or something. And she was in school full time too. And so our income together was like maybe 30 or 40,000, but we were full time students. so it was hard to really bring in a proper income when you're a full-time student. There's no excuse to be a full-time student and not work. Like that's just, I think you're a full-time student, you can cram your classes in three, four days, and that means you have three, four days off. So unless you're partying, you get no excuse to not uh, pull in a little income. So my first ever uh, mortgage at 19, I applied to TD, CIBC, a couple of credit unions, um, BMO and a couple others, and Bank of Montreal, BMO, took a chance and actually they have a risk pool. And I guess there's a certain number of people that fit into this special criteria. I was just pre, like I had already been pre-accepted to Ivy. I wasn't into I Ivy yet. And I said, look, this, all the, the major banks, TD, BMO, offer these lines of credits to at really low interest rates for Ivy students and for MBA students and things like that. And I said, hey, I, I can self-fund myself. I can get myself through school. Like I, I work, I got some scholarships. I'll self-fund. I live super frugally, so living costs are not an issue. What I need is a mortgage to buy a house so that I can live for free and actually profit, potentially, while I'm going through school. I can house hack. And so I thought that was that was the idea of buying a house. It wasn't about appreciation. It wasn't about adding value. In fact, my first renovation, I made so many mistakes that I probably over-renovated, didn't even get back the money that I spent renovating. And I got it back because I created extra bedrooms and bathrooms and an extra unit. So in time, it paid back through cash flow and house hacking. But my first ever deal... Um, it, it was a toughie. Like we, we got by by the skin of our teeth and I overpaid for the house in my opinion. Um, I let a realtor double end the deal and I, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I, I negotiated, I think it was listed for like 225 and I got it for 208, but market value was probably, you know, if I really negotiated a bit harder, I could have found something for 180, 190 that was equally good or better. Uh, it was in a good, good area. That was one of the things that we liked about this house. It was perfectly located between the college and the university, it just met all of our, all of our boxes and uh, convinced the one bank to say, hey, give us that student line of credit, close that, and instead give us a mortgage. Uh, I think the mortgage we're trying to get at the time was 160 something thousand, but 20% down, which people think is, wow, you did 20% down at 19? Yeah, we did. Um, Lisa and I split it and uh, took all my stock in investments. I've been day trading and stuff, trying to grow it. and. 
working hard. And I actually got an advance on my scholarship and then borrowed the money for some from family and some from the bank to cover my tuition. Um, so I used some of my scholarship money uh, to front <laughs> to front the down payment. So I took a, a bit of bit of risk, a bit of leverage, but I did it calculated and I did it from a position of um, knowing that it was the right right thing, right? So that's my first deal. And then I house hacked and lived in that for almost three years until I got my second deal. And the second deal went terribly. I applied to one bank and applied to a second bank as a backup. And even like, I didn't even really think about having a backup. It was like, as I smelled blood in the water with the first application, uh, the I'd already firmed up on the offer, so I had to close. Uh, I, I applied on the second deal. I let my realtor talk me into doing a firm offer before I really understood what that meant. So I, I couldn't back out or I'd be sued and I'd lose my deposit too. So I uh, went to a second lender and I ended up having to close my second rental property. It was a, it was a freehold um, attached property on one side with a walkout basement. It was a duplex, not legal, but rental licenses don't exist and they don't apply to freehold um, townhouses. They don't, if, you, if you're attached on one side and it's part of a, a corporation, there was no condo fee, but we were part of a corporation technically that had no condo fee, we were exempt. And so it was kind of a cool little um, deal. And uh, that property, I had to put 30% down to close. So I opened up a line of credit and I think I had 25% down myself and I had, I had to borrow 5% to get it done. And, uh, or no, I, I closed 30% in my cash and I used line of credit to do the renovations, that's right. So I tapped it all my renovation money, everything. And so the second property was just, Lisa and I were working full time for two years and we saved up the down payment. And I, I'm just super frugal. It was like save every year or two and then it gets faster as you get rental income. You can start saving down payments for properties. And so because I was so frugal, I, I was able to save my way to my second property at 30% down. Later refinanced that and then sold that building two years. I wish I still had it, it was a fantastic property. Sold to a friend of mine privately at work. He was looking for his first deal. Um, him and his wife just getting married. I think they still live in it today. It's worth double what I sold it to them for, but I sold it privately under market. Their friends wanted to help them out. Uh, it worked out because I had the timing on these two huge buildings that I wanted to take down. They were like 22 bedroom uh, triplex and triplex. And um, it worked out that I ended up selling that building a couple years later and closing on two at the same time. And so it just, every time I, I made a decision to sell something, it was to upsize or to buy something bigger or to unlock some equity and uh, put it to work. So that one was actually not a good deal. It's really, I did terrible on that one, 30% down. My next deal after that was 20% down as well. So 20%, 30%, 20% down. Um, on the third deal, fourth deal, 20% down. Every single deal after that was 20% down. But once I got to six, I was able to refinance. I sold my primary residence after living there for three years, that first house in 19. So at 22, three years later, we sold it, built something, and I got to put a little money down because it was a, a new build, and uh, bought, used the capital out of that to buy another rental property, renovated it, fixed it up, refinanced it, bought another one. And then I was saving the whole time, so I had another down payment just from our day jobs to buy another one, and then refinanced, I think, the third and fourth one to buy again two more, so it's like almost at 10. I did all that just like most of my success was that like literally we were house hacking. So we were spending nothing of what Elise was making. She's making 38,000 a year. And because we had tax credits, it's almost all in that take home. And I was making 50, 55 and then 60,000 in my third year as a manager once I got promoted. Uh, so I was just saving 100% of what I was making. Every dollar I got, literally if it didn't go into an RSP for a tax credit or a TFSA, it was literally going to trading. And then once I was trading on it, make as much as I could, I'd roll that into another property because my ROI in real estate levered up five to one was just way higher than anything I could get in the stock market. Yeah, that's that's kind of how my first five deals done. There was just uh, conventional bank financing. I didn't go to be lenders. I worked a full-time job, made $50,000 a year, went and applied each time. I tried to buy one by myself. The bank said no, had to put a lease on, so we had to buy them together, which was a mistake because later on I, have, I had to move them. I'd move us off both being on title. Big mistake, don't buy together on title if you can avoid it. I didn't know what I was doing back then. And so when the bank said, this is how you have to do it or the deal doesn't get approved, I just said, yeah, okay. Didn't have any backup options. Didn't know how to make, navigate through the finance world and didn't know brokers and things like that. So when, when my mobile broker said, this is what you have to do, I just, I did it. Uh, and, but yeah, we, we basically bought them together. So we capped out real quick. I think when I got to 10 mortgages, um, because we were buying them together, we capped out quick. At Scotiabank right now, you can still buy, it used to be 15, now it's down to 10 properties. 
um, you can still buy 10 per person. So 10 in one spouse's name, 10 in the other, that's 20 rental properties right there before you even cap out at like a lender Scotiabank. And then CIBC will do five in a corp and five in your personal name. Every bank will do five uh, mortgages. So you can space it out. If you buy a couple at the same time, potentially a couple different banks, you could easily get like 15 mortgages yourself if you make, geez, I don't know, like 50 grand a year, 40 grand a year. So there's definitely a way to do it. Um, I learned how to get creative with financing once I lost, once I retired from my job and didn't have a job. So that's when I learned to get more creative and figured out there's other ways to take deals down. I can still take deals down today without um, really needing that. So yeah, those are my first five deals. Not super proud about how I took things down. My key success factor was I was super frugal. So I renovated super cheap and I just saved like an animal. I think regardless of investing in real estate or not, my key success factor was that I just saved everything. If I made rental income, saved it. Day job income, saved it. Just didn't spend, super, super frugal. And so that was sort of how I got it done. But I'm sure there's lots of things that I'm, I'm not thinking about right now that were pertinent to my success. But yeah. Next questions, going back up. That was the super chat, so I promised I'd give that priority. Now I'm going back up to the top. We might swing back to talking about Puerto Rico and Costa Rica and the philosophy of capitalism, socialism too, we'll see. Dylan says, I'm thinking of getting citizenship by investing in St. Lucia, 100,000 USD and no capital gains tax, no income tax, et cetera. Canada is going down a bad path. No way I'm going to be paying 75% capital gains tax. Yeah, Dylan, that's crazy. I, I've been hearing some things talked about just on social media. I don't know how, how valid they are. I'd have to go fact check them, but talking about things like a 75% capital gains tax and talking about getting rid of the half inclusion on capital gains tax and talking about how your primary residence might not be capital gains tax free going forward. There might be limits on it and they might start taxing people in their primary residences. And I'm like, geez, can't like, the government's just looking for places to grab money from. And because like the government's just a puppet to the top 0.01%, like the billionaires, they're never going to tax them, which is what they should do, to be honest. Like the ultra rich are who should be hit, not the you know people just trying to get by with a few million bucks. Like let them get their fire, let them enjoy things. You know, they've worked hard for what they have. I don't know. I, I think maybe putting... I'm okay with looking at a standard distribution of all of the wealth disparity and saying, hey, the people at the bottom need a little bit of help. So if you're making like under two grand a month, let's bump everyone up to like the two grand a month mark. And I'm okay with saying, hey, you know, people making a billion, we're gonna cap you down to like, you know, 500 million or something, right? Just by doing that, it's actually like, it works out to a little bit tighter range and you get what you work for, but there are limits, right? Like you can't own the whole country. Just like there are limits and regulation on monopolies. Like you can't be the only hydro, like you can't be the only, if you're a cell phone provider or something, you can't be the only cell phone provider. There's not allowed, you're allowed to have free competition. And so that keeps things, you know, under control. And I think that when you get to that level of wealth, no one can compete against you because the buried entry is you have so much capital, you can just drown them with marketing or lower your price and force them out of business. And so I think there's, some regulation makes sense. I think that's kind of where I've landed philosophically that like a completely free market doesn't really work because you'll have people that will just destroy the earth. Um, no consequence for destroying natural resources. Like in the simulations where people go out and they do the fishing, you know, every, in, in sustainability and business, we studied the fishing uh, experiment where you have like different groups of like eight or nine groups of companies that all have to fish, you know, some fish reserve. And what ends up almost always happening is people fish the shit out of the fish till all the fish are extinct. And that's what happens in a free market. So you have to put regulation and you have to have, or, or what they'll do is they'll collude. A couple of the fishing companies will collude and one guy go out and fish it all. Or they'll, it's just, you have to set up certain rules because in a completely free market, humans are ruthless and we will destroy this planet and cut each other up, you know, at the throat if there aren't some, some rules to play in. So I like a free market with some, you know, some small rules, not too much regulation, but a little bit can make sense. That's maybe where I differ from, from Peter Schiff, I think on his completely free market philosophy. And I personally, I just don't feel good. Like I grew up with nothing and understanding what it's like to be hungry and going through poverty and people in that circle, you don't have anyone to mentor you and you don't have any way to elevate. And so I think that there needs to be some social ladders there to help the people who want to climb out of that, climb out of that. And so I think it's the responsibility of us in the top 1% or whatever, top half, let's say, to pay something for that. So I'm okay paying a little bit of tax to ensure my fellow people are okay. Peter Schiff argues that, you know, if you're wealthy, that wealthy people will start charities. And maybe that's true. Like as I build more wealth, I have a, a strong desire 
to want to give back, to want to start a charity where I can help, um, you know, influence. And he argues that, you know, private individuals do a better job at spending their money because they're more efficient than the government, which wastes money through bureaucracy. You give them a million bucks and it goes almost nowhere. You put a million dollars in private, they actually help people. So I think there's something to that. And I, I see charities like the Canadian uh, Terry Fox Society for, for Cancer and stuff, and they burn like 60, 70 cents on the dollar, doesn't even make it towards cancer research. So even private charities, tons of corruption, tons of, uh, just, just tons of bad stuff going on in, inside of corporations. So I think I, I'd love to see that if there was a more efficient route to helping people, we need to, there needs to be charity in society. Like the people in the bottom half are born without, or have some genetic issue or whatever, a mental illness, someone needs to be there to help those people. But to an extent, to a limit, with conditions. You know what I mean? Like you give someone, you know, free education, maybe they have to volunteer or something. You know what I mean? Maybe they have to work for it. Say, hey, you can have a free education if you grew up with less than certain income. We want you to elevate and get the skills you need to, to rise up in the social ladder. But there's a condition. Um, you're going to have to, you know, give back in some way once you get there. Or, you know, some sort of stipulation or condition where you have to pay it back in some way. Maybe it's volunteering while you're getting that free education. Maybe it's working doing something in that field to better society. But I think if we all work together, that's really what is at the heart of a good economic system in, in society is this idea that we, we're all in it together. We got to work together, but we're not all equal. Like that's, that's bullshit. Like we're just not. I'm built to work 90 hours a week. There was a time where I could outwork anyone. I could do four hours of sleep and I could do it every day. I know people who work five hours and they're exhausted. That person isn't cut from the same cloth I am. Should they have the exact same resources and allocations as I do if I work three jobs and they work one? I don't think that's fair. So, I mean, I can't agree with the, the whole like completely equalized things, but I think try to equalize opportunity and give people you know a hand when they need it. So that's kind of where I fall philosophically. Anyway, let's keep going with the questions. Next question. Um, I haven't really researched St. Lucia, but I hear it's a beautiful place to vacation. Chris says, do you believe in diversifying your portfolio right away or focus on real estate to build capital fast and branch out later? So I believe that there is safety in diversity. And so I'm a big fan of diversity. I prefer to have 10 buildings to one. I prefer to have multiple asset classes uh, as opposed to just real estate as an example. That is why less than half of my net worth is currently in real estate. Uh, small fact, people didn't know that. They probably thought I'm majority in real estate because I, I was pre previously. Uh, but I believe that diversifying early on has negative consequences if you're a high performer and you've outlined a path where you're able to deliver extraordinary returns. So you have some sort of competitive advantage. If that's a business you've discovered, some cool business or something, you're like, hey, um, you know, X business is, you know, you, you could do that twice as good as someone else. Pour all your money into that business. Like 100%, if you find a competitive advantage, like for me, I found real estate. And I was like, hey, I can buy properties, 70 cents on the dollar, turn them around and make a lot of money levered five to one. The bank loves to lend against real estate. That was my golden goose strategy to building wealth. That was my ladder. And I have different ladders now. I've diversified because who knows what can happen. I can afford to diversify. But going in the, in the beginning of the journey, I think that it makes more sense to find that thing and go all in on it. But if you did, imagine if you didn't have that competitive advantage. Let's say you're just buying turnkey real estate and you didn't have any competitive advantage. Don't dump all your money on real estate. Spread it out. Put a little bit in, in you know, like consumables, you know, industrial stuff, whatever. Like pick a bunch of different industries and build a balanced portfolio. Buy a rental property. Put some money in something else too. Um, I think it makes sense to diversify. There's a lot of safety in that. If the real estate market crashes tomorrow, you're not gone. Like you're not wiped out, right? So when you don't diversify, you take more risk. With more risk, you can often get a better return. So it's depends where you're at in your in your goal. Like I'm a conservative investor. So every and I say this and most people think I'm extremely aggressive because of the risks that I've taken. Every risk I've taken is super calculated to the point where I've managed the risk to in my own, um, my philosophy and I get a high enough return that it's worth those risks. So that one time I didn't get paid back. I lent out a six figure sum, I'm still in the pursuit of trying to get that back. But that's an example of like an investment that didn't go well. And that's okay because I made a bunch of other investments that went really well. And I factored in that like 10% of the time I'm going to get screwed and I'm going to get zero. I literally invest my money and I get, if I get paid nothing back, that's a risk I took, right? 
Um, but someone starting out, if they didn't diversify and they just lent it all to one person, you can imagine what could happen. Like that person doesn't pay them back, they go bankrupt, whatever. You're screwed, right? So it's managing risk is the important thing, Chris. Brendan says, Project Life Mastery did this. If you're not familiar with him, give him a look. He was from Vancouver. Huh, so I'll have to write that down. Someone, I'm not gonna remember this. So someone messaged me on Instagram the name Project Life Mastery. I'll check it out. Dylan says, it's very scary. Canadians are ignorant because they haven't experienced socialism and communism. They won't realize it has taken over until it is too late. Interesting. Cold as heck over here in Vancouver too. Hmm, James, well, usually Vancouver is relatively mild. Javier says, typically Canadians go to Panama. Panama doesn't seem very safe, very desirable to me. Um, just been, and I haven't been, but I have friends who've gone and I've you know, did a little bit of research. It might be, probably is beautiful too. Ace of Spades says, um, how can I find people who need private money? I wanna try private lending, but don't know where to start. Maybe mortgage brokers? Ace of Spades, definitely. Reach out in local real estate groups and say, hey, I have capital, I'm looking to fund deals, please pitch me. Reach out to local mortgage brokers and say, hey, I have capital, I wanna invest. If you come across any deals that, you know, they're with the lender and it falls through the last minute, give me a call, happy to put a second mortgage on or whatever to put a deal together. That's the way to do it, yeah, 100%. Dylan says, is there a, is there citizenship by investment in Costa Rica and how much is it? Dylan, my understanding is 250,000 um, USD to buy a, a, either a business or a house. So you just gotta buy something down there. Or you can show, my understanding was, you could show fixed income coming in from like a pension or something or investment um, type of annuity or something to that effect. And you can qualify with that. Myself, I have quite a bit of uh, passive income from uh, dividends and things that I could show it probably would work, but I'd have to look into that. Javier says you get the tax incentives there also, which is pretty cool. I have to look into that as well. Greg Wood says time to vacation six months of the year in Costa Rica. Ah, five months and three weeks, six months and one week in Canada. You gotta stay one, you gotta be in Canada a little bit longer than a, a six months to stay and keep your health benefits. But the problem with that is then I still am paying the tax in Canada at like 55%. My tax rate is like 55%. So that sucks. Costa Rica is beautiful, but I'm biased because I have a Costa Rican ancestor. That's awesome. Link the hero of time. Alejandro says, what company do you use as a qualified intermediary when doing a 1031 exchange? I don't know. I'm not a US citizen, so I've never done a 1031 exchange. It's not a Canadian thing. I don't know. Um, Google that. There's probably, uh, I'm sure there are lots of qualified inter intermediaries you can find on Google. Prey says, uh, is it hard to become a citizen of Puerto Rico? I don't know. It's a good Google search. I'm sure that um, from people I've started to talk to, I heard that it's actually pretty easy. There's hoops you have to jump through, but you can invest in a business. You can you know, buy a property, you start residing there, and then it's fairly easy, I hear. So, and then I guess you become a U.S. citizen uh, as well by being a Puerto Rican citizen. Price and Pride says, what is your recommendation for someone that purchased an investment condo at the top of the market and now because of the pandemic can't cash flow as a rental? Uh, don't buy anything at the top of the market is the first thing, right? But I mean, the best time to know is, uh, like the best time was yesterday, I guess, to know that, right? It's too late now, you've already bought it. One option, it, well, if you bought a property that didn't cash flow in the first place, dispose of that asset. That's Typically, that's my mindset. If I bought something that didn't cash flow, it means I made a mistake. And if you bought it at the top of the market, even worse. Hopefully, you bought something that didn't cash flow and it appreciated and you can just sell it off. Um, I don't like to hold things that don't cash flow. So if you bought at the top of the market a condo that doesn't appreciate, if it's a condo in Toronto, now is not a good time to sell. So maybe you could say, hey, I'm losing 100 bucks a month or 200 bucks a month. I can hold out for a year till this COVID stuff ends and then sell it next spring and you'll get maybe 5% more for it. And that 5% more is way more than the, uh, on the sale price is way more than the cash flow you're gonna lose for the next year. And so the numbers could support holding it for another year until you have a good exit opportunity. But in general, I, I would like to avoid stuff that doesn't cash flow unless it's extremely undervalued. Like if someone brought me a condo for 70 cents on the dollar, doesn't cash flow, I'd probably buy that because it's under market and there's an opportunity, but I'm not gonna pay at market for something that doesn't cash flow. It's like the two, um, things you don't want. So when you get into a bad investment, you gotta find a way to divest from that in a strategic way. And if holding it for another year means you get no return at all for another year, 
and you could have bought something else that was at 80 cents on the dollar, then it might make sense to sell now and lock in, even though we're at a bad time to sell a condo in Toronto or whatever, New York, at least you'd be, you know, taking that money and having an opportunity to invest it elsewhere and make more money elsewhere. So it could make sense to sell. There's so many variables and factors that it's hard to really say without knowing the whole situation and having a crystal ball. Greg says, work should be incentivized and rewarded. Agreed. And did you, I don't think it is hard to become a citizen of Costa Rica. And the living costs in Costa Rica are like half. Like you can literally have a nanny cook and clean for you and take care of your kids for like five, 10 bucks USD a day. Like the, the wages there are ridiculous. Um, so when we go there with our large sums of capital, we go, like our money just goes two, three times as far. And so that's a, a benefit of, of being there as well. And that wasn't really a factor in my decision. It was mostly taxes and lifestyle, but that's just like another bonus that draws people in to retiring there. I've heard of people moving overseas for fire and some say it's really not worth it because they're always an outsider from the people there. Well, Alice, I hear that there are communities in places like Costa Rica that are all expats, meaning people from Canada and the US, et cetera, that have moved there. And so you join one of those communities ideally and live there. So you'd be among family, all doing the same sort of thing. And then you wouldn't feel like an outsider. And I'd pick up myself, I'd be fluent in Spanish in probably three, four months. And so then it wouldn't be an issue within six to eight months, it'd be all right. That's my plan anyway, if I were to go down there. Dylan says, yes, you can. Then the central bank's printing money and resulting inflation for the growing divide. Yeah, that's, that's true too, the printing of the money. If the economy doesn't catch up to the money printed, which the hope is that it does, right? The hope is that you know, all this newfound growth created, even things like crypto are creating need for more fiat. Um, then I, I think that there's, you know, there's hope that it'll catch up and we won't go through hyperinflation. Who knows? They can always contract the money supply. They can always raise interest rates. There's lots of things they could do to reverse this, but it would be painful. Alice says, I think I feel like you have enough money. You should just live where you want and not just move to save even more. Well, Alice, I think another piece is, oh, so money is always a factor. Like I can live in a really nice house here in Canada and I have more money than I need. And I can afford to pay the tax, but I could just live a such, such a better life in say like Costa Rica where I have a freaking compound um, for the same cost as maintaining my life here, right? So it's, they're not apples and apples. Like to compare the same cost, like say $100,000 a year lifestyle here versus $100,000 a year lifestyle in Costa Rica. By the way, I'm saving say $400,000 in tax by being in Costa Rica. Boom, that means I can live a $500,000 a year life in Costa Rica, which by the way, $500,000 a year spending in Costa Rica gets you a freaking compound with an army of staff, right? Like you can do a lot with that kind of money down there. You, you have to really think about the money. It's a big piece, right? Um, and you're comparing lifestyles and you say, hey, which lifestyle is better? So, yeah. Inside View Photography says, I was looking into less tax countries but having a hard time getting around taxes when I'm mostly into real estate investing. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna pay tax with real estate as well. Um, the challenge is if you're, your Canadian real estate portfolio is generating income in Canada, you have to file a Canadian tax return to pay tax on that. So it's not ideal if you wanna completely move to like say Costa Rica and pay no Canadian tax to have rental properties. So that's why you need to figure out, put them in someone else's name or cash them out maybe. There are lots of alternatives and options to think through. If you do wanna file like an exit return from Canada and stop paying tax in Canada. So something to think about or the US is the same. I think with Canada, at least you keep your citizenship. If you're US, then you lose your citizenship. Next. Greetings, Mr. Rosar. Greetings to you, too. Good to see you on. Hey, Mike, hope you had a great week. I did, thank you, Sebastian. Greg says, easy way out. We'd become fat blobs. We need motivation and incentives. It's true, people want the easy way out. Free market capitalism is potentially the answer. I don't know. I seem to lean towards that as opposed to communism, but I think somewhere you know, there's probably a middle ground that makes the most sense for everyone. I, I know I thrive in a free market system. I tend to rise to the top because I work harder and I'm smart about how I invest. There are people though who just aren't built like me and they won't do well in that system. So I guess we look at systems and say, what system works best for the majority of people? And that's kind of where we would want to decide, I guess, from a philosophical approach but that doesn't benefit me and mine. So 
obviously I'm going to vote for the system that I would live best in, which is a free market system. And most of my friend group is fairly hardworking and would also benefit from that system. So that's what it is to be human is to be, uh, to do that, I guess, is to do what's best for our, ourselves. Let's young people in Latin America are very friendly. Yeah, I hear that. Joe. Oh, Jimmy. Not on, not on his watch. Greg says social programs and basic needs for the bottom 10% is a good thing. I agree. Link the hero Costa Rica is paradise on earth. Friendly, yes, but just from what I've read from other people's experience, they don't really see you as a friend. That's what I mean about the outsider thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you could join groups where you would be well received and that would be a big piece of it is finding people who are like yourself. And that would be where you you know get to feel like you're you're part of it. I don't feel like I'm part of being a Canadian. Like half the Canadians I meet are like, you know, drinking beer all weekend and you know, living paycheck to paycheck. I don't get along with someone like that. Like I have different, my ideals just don't align with the average Canadian, right? So I'm used to being abnormally different. I'm used to, in the workplace, I wasn't like everyone else, right? Like I'm eating a bag lunch, everyone else is going out and enjoying lunch, um, but just, just different philosophies, right? And so, I mean, whenever you go to a new country, that's the beauty is being able to immerse yourself in a new culture. And I think that's, that's a way for you to grow and your family to grow and your mindset to grow. Will your wife let you move? My wife would love it. I think she's all about it. We've been talking about it for a long time and uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for us. She'd be all over it, I think, for sure. But yeah, you definitely have to make sure your, your significant other is on board with a decision like that, for sure. Kyle says, we'd miss you around these parts though, Mikey. Hey, you know what? I, I grew up southwestern Ontario, so I'll be back. Like, even if I moved to Costa Rica, I'd be back like three, four months a year, for sure. I'd just have a rental house down here or something, right, that I would stay in. So I would never be gone from Canada. I have too many friends and family and everything here that if I moved, it would just be for tax reasons seven months a year. <laughs> um, I'd be back still, for sure. I just wouldn't want to pay all the tax. I pray unnecessarily. I mean, you could always move there and move back. If you don't like it, you want to move to Costa Rica for time. I think that'd be cool. Exactly. I've always wanted to try living in different places and experience that. I think having kids slowed me down on doing that. You know, having a third kid, it's, it's a lot to do with kids, but I think it's actually better for my kids to go through that and experience being immersed in a different culture for say six months. That's something that, you know, if we don't like it, we can always come back, right? Not a big deal. We've got the money to do that. So yeah, it's something I'm thinking about experimenting with this fall. Next question. What do you think about the Smith Maneuver and the types of investments allowed and the strategies of high dividend and low dividend but high growth ETFs? Um, James, I think that um, Smith Maneuver is great. If you can take the interest from your house, take the money from your house, borrow it, invest it somewhere else, and then make that mortgage interest tax deductible here in Canada, that is the Smith Maneuver. It's a great thing. I also believe leverage is a good thing, especially when it's tax deductible. I believe that dividends are great if you need the cash flow. I'm primarily a dividend investor. I, I think there's a place for growth, but I like to get consistent, stable cash flow. As far as like levered ETFs, I try to avoid levered ETFs um, for a number of reasons. As far as growth ETFs, I prefer to pick my own stocks than buy an ETF fund, but I don't know. The, the data suggests that you're probably better off just buying an ETF than trying to pick your own. So for the average person who doesn't have a huge portfolio, I would say go with the ETF route. Uh, Josh says, I'm making my first offer. Do you have any advice? Going in with no conditions for a property in Sudbury, looking to burn, but won't get the full amount back, around 15% left in if all goes well. So if you put 20% down, then you'd be only be able to pull out 5% plus your renovations. That... Uh, I don't know if that's even a burr. Like by definition, the burr is getting your down payment out, I think. So that wouldn't be a burr, but it, I guess it's a partial burr, which is good. Um, honestly, my first few deals were partial burrs. I didn't even know what a burr was. It took me like five, six deals, seven deals to even figure it out. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's the journey, right? You get started, you don't know how to buy the best stuff. Tips for buying, I would say, don't compete. You don't want to be bidding against other people because if you win, you're the loser. If, you're, if there's like six offers on a property and you win, you've lost. 
because you overpaid. I like to not compete. I like to find a good deal. That said, there are some wholesale stuff. There's some wholesale stuff going around that's overpriced anyway. So really, really study your comparables. Know the market. Know what things have sold for. Have lots of comparables, not just one that you're anchoring your price off of. And then focus on cash flow. In a market like Sunbury, um, I'd expect double the cash flow that I'm getting here in London. So if I'm buying 1% rule in London, it better be 2% rule or 3% rule in Sudbury because the risk is a lot larger. The market isn't as diversified. Underlying fundamentals perspective, there's just a lot more risk investing in small. Allah says, I think Biden will ruin the government's tax scheme. Well, they track everything you buy in your wallet and they tax the hell out of it. So I don't know how you're buying and selling Bitcoin without the government knowing about it. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure the government gets their piece no matter what. Even if you mine it, you have to just, you disclose when you mine it, and you pay tax on it, right? Alexander says, no one spends our money better than ourselves. Probably true. Probably we're more likely to ensure that if we give a dollar to charity, that dollar really goes to help someone. Then if we give it to an organization, where it gets lost in the cogs and wasted inefficiency and general bureaucracy. Burton says, hey Mike, great answers. Wanted to know, do you think real estate in and around the GTA is too overpriced? Is it better instead to put money in the market into dividend yielding stocks in 2021? Varun, I don't know. Um, because they're printing so much money and because the market confidence is so high given low interest rates right now, mostly stimulated, stimulated by low interest rates, both real estate and the general stock market and valuation of companies right now is at all time highs. It is directly a component or derivative of low interest rates. So it depends how you think interest rates are gonna play out in the coming months and years. Do you think we're gonna stay in a low interest rate environment like we are today or will we come up 25 basis points or 50 basis points? Those are all factors in your consideration, right? As interest rates rise, the value of dividend yield plays goes down. But people can get a better interest rate elsewhere they are like, okay, they will switch from dividends to you know higher interest rate paying investments. When interest rates are really low, everyone's like, oh, forget this bunk. There's no yield right now. Everything's so cheap. And instead, everyone borrows money on you know, credit and then buys like real estate and dividend yielding stocks. So dividend yielding stocks should be uh, overpriced or in higher demand than they would have been otherwise in a higher interest rate environment. It's just inverses of each other. It's just kind of how it works. So. I have a light, nice large dividend portfolio. One of the reasons is I like the st stability of the cash flow and I like that I can lever it up well. Most of the banks will go 70% loan to value lines of credits on dividend yielding Canadian stocks. And there's Canadian, there's benefits from Canadian eligible dividends. There isn't from US dividends as an example, being a Canadian. And so the tax ramifications and the lending uh, ramifications of buying Canadian eligible dividends, there's some, some good benefits. So that's why I like a Canadian dividend portfolio. I like to buy companies that cash flow. That's always been my focus. I try to pick stuff that's gonna grow and do well over time. But yeah, dividends have been a, a solid play for me for some time now. So I don't know what the best one is for 2021. I have a large dividend portfolio because interest rates are so low right now. Um, I have a good side real estate portfolio too, but and I'm still looking for deals, but I, I just can't find anything that's attractive enough for me. And honestly, for where I'm at in my stage right now, even if I found a good deal in real estate, it's a lot of work, a lot of time investment. Whereas I find a good deal on a stock, it's no time at all. Click, 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 done. Like with real estate, there's a lot of stress, even just to close the property, talking to your lawyer, getting financing, coordinating renovations, whatever, tenant drama, et cetera, so forth. There's a lot of stress there. At my stage in the journey, if I get an 8% return versus a 10% return, I'm happy with 8% and no work. So that's, that's just me. And, to be honest, I target like a 14% annual return for my overall portfolio, but uh, but yeah, 14% is like the goal to grow at minimum, minimum. I, I try to target 20 as a stretch goal. Depends on the year. With appreciation, I can definitely hit that, but without appreciation, it's tough. Hey Mike, head down to Florida and do real estate there. Yeah, it could be an option too. It's definitely not out of the cards. Uh, Follow up on the last one. Does it make sense to have rental properties in different cities and have property management to manage them? Do you have personal experience with these sorts of properties? Um, I have my entire portfolio outsourced so I can speak to property management. They will not do as good of a job as you will do, but you don't have to worry about it. They do the work for you. So there's something to that. 
um, just factor in that like if you don't have a vacancy rate of at least 10% of a bad debt expense of at least 10% of a maintenance fund of at least double whatever you have now probably, then you're under budgeting the actual cash flow of a manager in place. Properties don't run that cash flow positive with property management in place. Like even 1% real properties sometimes don't cash flow with bad management in place. I'll give you an example. Uh, I have a property that sat vacant. So the tenant left, uh, kind of trashed. They left a couple days late, so we couldn't rent it for the first of the month. It was destroyed anyway, so it took them a month to clean it up. The property manager was slow, so they finally got it fixed up. That said they moved out. Hypothetically, let's just say they moved out December 3rd or 2nd. The tenant didn't pay the rent for November, so we lost November's rent. They trashed the place, so we had to fix it up. And then we couldn't rent it out for January 1st because it didn't get it fixed up till like January 2nd or something. And so we couldn't rent it out for, to a good tenant till February or March. And so it sat vacant for basically got no rent in November because they didn't pay bad debt expense. Then Jan then uh, December didn't get paid because we're fixing it up. And we have all the costs to fix it up, which is thousands. And then January, no rent. And then February, you might have a tenant move in March 1st. And that's normal. That happens every couple of years on a unit with a property manager. So. That's reality, that's real life. Everyone's budgeting, they're getting rented every month, cash is coming in, tenants always pay, tenants don't pay, tenants trash your unit, budget like half your cash flow just for fixing up the units, and then the other half your cash flow for vacancy, because your manager doesn't care. And by the way, when the tenant, when the manager places the tenant, they take you know up to a month's rent. Do you mean? Hello? Sorry, someone called me a bunch of times. Am I still here? Can you guys see me right now? Someone called me a bunch of times and it turned off my, I clicked it and it clicked me out of the, the app that I'm in. So I'm back on YouTube, I think. I don't know. Someone tell me if I am. Are we frozen right now? Okay, you can see me, perfect. Good. I'll go back to what I was talking about, which is how crappy owning rental properties with property management is. Um, if you're buying smart though, you get a huge lift on the burr. So it can still make sense to buy properties outside of town. And I've done it and made money, but I'm just saying, don't count on the kind of cash flow that you're ex you're probably expecting compared to managing yourself. Like notice that, let's say, a long, I've seen 1% rural properties not cash flow with uh, property management in place. So just factor that in. You'll probably get mortgage pay down. You probably make a little bit of money on average. And just factor in the first six months you own it, you might, if you bought a somewhat distressed property, you might have no cash flow for the first six months just because that's what it takes to get a property stabilized. And then tenants move out a year later, you might have no cash flow again for three months. And maybe positive cash flow again. But those periods where you have no negative cash flow and you're dumping money in, um, that's tough. It's tough to be in that position. I've been there. That's, that's one of the tough things about real estate investing, for sure. Okay, I got to wrap this up. I got to put my daughter to bed. Um, I'm going to try to do one more question here. I think I got through them all though. Uh, off top of question. Oh, this, this chair here. I guess this is a gift for my birthday. Um, my thought is this, when it comes to buying chairs, I am appreciative of this chair, but I will say this, um, they spend a lot of money on aesthetic. And I think honestly, a good office chair for 250 bucks is more comfortable and ergonomic than the nicest gaming chairs. So avoid the word gaming in your, in your chair that you're buying. They look good. I mean, it's got nice leather. It's, it's a quality made chair, I will say. But um, I don't know. I, I think you could buy a better office chair for like 300 bucks. It's more comfortable without the branding of gaming attached to it, right? So. Uh, thanks for the wisdom. Wanted to find out if there's a way to buy a second house less than 20% down. Uh, theoretically, you could if you're moving into it with CMHC or Genworth or one of these mortgage financing companies, you could buy 5% down. But um, it would have to be that you're buying it like as a cottage if you're primary residence, is my understanding. You can do it more than once, but you can't go buy, start buying rental properties and still have your primary residence at a 5% down mortgage. So that's something you got to factor in. I'm not an expert on those, but that's my understanding. Uh, yes, we do still have the Airbnb property in Florida. What do you disagree with Peter Schiff on? I think I missed that question earlier when I was trying to skip through. And if I missed your question, post it again at the end in the comments and I'll go back on and answer it. But uh, some of the stuff he says, I think it's a little myopic. His, some of his views on some stuff is a little bear, more bearish than I think, you know, I think it is the real set of facts. 
he tends to play things out like everything's doomsday. And I think he makes mountains on a molehills sometimes. Somebody says, totally on point, love it, agree with it. But some of the things he talks about, I don't think things will be as bad as he makes it sound. Not that things won't get bad, not that we won't have inflation, not that, you know, gold might not, I think gold probably will be a good investment, right? Or whatever, like, you know, land or other um, solid hard assets. But um, yeah, he has a point, right? That the government through inflation basically taxes you, right? Because then everything inflates in value, they get to tax you on capital gains and all the growth you just got. That it's not even any real buying power at all. So you're, a lot of what he says is solid, but some of the ways, some of the conclusions he comes to are a little extreme for me. But again, super smart guy, really well-spoken, super focused on his goal of um, buying gold and, you know, talking about, you know, the the end of days uh, as with the current petrodollar and the, the inflation associated with it. So he has a lot of great stuff. I love sharing his content. Um, yeah. Are you a gamer? Yes. In... I, I like to game. Um, I'm not really a gamer anymore, but I used to be really heavy into like World of Warcraft, Star Wars Galaxies, um, like RuneScape. I used to play a lot of, it's basically, basically World of Warcraft, uh, League of Legends, Age of Empires, Age of Mythology, all those kinds of games, RTSs, stuff like that, MMORPGs, I was big into those. Some shooters, didn't really get into shooters a ton, but mostly computer, computer games, but I just haven't had the time lately, and honestly the desire. I'm playing some Age of Empires 3, uh, the definitive edition got released in October. So if anyone wants to play that, um, I only play if people invite me and we do like matches with friends, but uh, I have a few friends who still play. So I'll play that occasionally. Um, yeah, maybe the uh, game of league here or there, but yeah, I just don't have the same desire I used to, but yeah, at my heart, I'm a gamer. Like I've got, I've got my 10,000 hours clocked in video games. That's for sure. It's one of the, one of the things I used to have mastery over. It's been a long time, but I used to play a lot, a lot, 16 hours a day, World of Warcraft kind of style. All right, everyone, got to the end. I got to say goodnight to my daughter. Thank you all so much for, for watching and uh, listening and joining me tonight on the stream and, and honestly on Instagram, Mike Rosehart. I appreciate all you guys following along on the journey and sharing your thoughts with me. If you're from Puerto Rico or Costa Rica or hell, Florida, message me. Let's link up. Let's uh, share ideas. And thank you all so much for contributing tonight in the super chats. Appreciate it. You guys know the secret to unlocking a wealth through you and reaching financial independence is simple. Three levers. Spend less, earn more, and maximize returns on the difference. Have a good night, everyone.